Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us for our fourth annual Melissa and Doug Demo Day. Let's give a round of applause for that, please. I think I've met most of you, but um, in case I haven't, I'm Howie, and uh, I have the honor of uh, representing Melissa and Doug Entrepreneurs and have been uh, representing Melissa and Doug Entrepreneurs for the last four years. Um, what I'm going to do here is I know that there are a number of you who are new to Melissa and Doug Entrepreneurs, and so you have some questions about what is this program and uh, you know what have the students that are here tonight, what have they been through? and and um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the program in pictures. I'm a photographer. I take many photos. And I just think it's a great way to take you on the journey of what this past year has been like. So the program runs for about a year. We select students starting in February. And we're ending with what we have uh, today, the demo day. Um, in photos, what that looks like is after we select the students, we fly them all up here to Melissa and Doug's house, and we are in the room that you just walked through over there. And we spend a day with them talking about their startups and uh, what ideas they're working on. And Melissa and D Doug give great comments. Here you see the students uh, sitting there, <laughs> sitting there, meditating on the comments from Melissa and Doug. Uh, we have a great dinner here. We go play on this very sport court right here. I think this was a game where uh, the Children under 10 ended up outscoring all the adults and, 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 and students combined. That's actually true. Um, and then the next morning, we go to Melissa and Doug's office, and we meet with their senior staff, get to talk with them about what they do, and get to workshop uh, each student's ideas. And then we send all of the students on their way for spring break. This was the moment when we realized that the snow, which had come in, would not stop us from getting uh, Uzoma to uh, Cancun. And then everyone gets a, a chance to pit, pinch Howie. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's what that shows. And then what happens is after, um, after that great spring break trip, which it kind of lays the foundation for the program, we start to meet on a regular basis. Uh, here's just one of many meetings that we have uh, at least once a week. And there's another photo. And then the students that have made enough progress end up progressing through to the summer. They earn a $5,000 stipend, and they are off to the races uh, building and running their startups full time during the summer. So here they are working at some co-working space in Durham. Here's another meeting. Um, and we're, the coaches that are pictured here, we're always talking and, and trying to figure out how best we can help the students and connecting them to many of you here in the audience. And then what happens is uh, the students are off, and they're doing all sorts of things. And they start sending us uh, these great updates. Like Frank said, hey, I've made you know, $1,300 in revenue. That was May 7th. Uh, Mackenzie just wrote us and said, hey, you know, after months and months and months, we finally got the contract with Duke University signed. Um, Ray says, you know, hey, I went down to Atlanta, and I visited with my first customer. And, you know, they ended up, you know, uh, connecting us to another customer. So we just, you know, start to work with it. We start to hear reports from the students uh, out in the field uh, as to the progress with all their startups. And then what happens is that we start to prepare for tonight. So this is the fall semester. And so this is a photo uh, from just last week of us doing uh, late night rehearsals till 1030 at night. Um, here is just last night, we did a Duke event in New York City, and one of our presenters tonight was pitching in front of a group of 100 alumni. And this is just uh, two hours ago. We were in the hotel lobby, uh, just standing there and presenting and practicing even more. And so that leads us to, to this event that we have here. Um, we couldn't do this without uh, a, an amazing team, obviously Melissa and Doug, who have been uh, so generous with making the program and making their house available, um, have been instrumental. Um, I do phone calls with them regularly. We do phone calls with them regularly with students that um, are working on problems. It's really a tremendous um, uh, thing that they are providing, not just their, not just their uh, kind of name and, and their help, but also just their active contribution. Um, we also have Tatiana and Jake, who are over there, um, and Steve McClellan, who is a new colleague who has been amazing 
I want to brag on Tatiana and Jake a little bit because not only are they coaches in the program, but they themselves are entrepreneurs and they themselves are, um, 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 have done uh, an amazing job uh, with their company. So Tatiana um, started her company and I'd ask Tatiana and Jake, and Jake to actually come on up here so they can stand with me because they deserve a lot of credit. So Tatiana actually started her company I know, yeah, I didn't tell you, sorry, surprise. Uh, so Tatiana started a company when she was an undergrad and um, she has since gone on to create the world's best uh, all natural energy drink. Here she is winning Google Demo Day, uh, which included uh, an investment of 100,000, $100,000. And now she has a successful business with a line of fantastic energy drinks. They are dominating the Southeast, and uh, if you're not in the Southeast, they will be coming to a grocery store near you. But you can get it on Amazon. And you can get it on Amazon, I love that, I love that, yes. In fact, everyone here must order a case of Mati before they leave. Uh, and Jake here um, also started a company while he was an undergrad. You didn't know I was gonna pull this photo of you yeah. up here. I don't know, I don't know if you like it? Oh good, all right. Great. And what he has figured out is that uh, he worked in the neuroscience labs at Duke, and what he figured out is that um, rather than medicating people who have attention deficit problems who can't focus, uh, he was working in these neuroscience labs, and he realized that you could track the actual brain waves of people, and you can create games to train them on how to focus more. So this is an actual game that um, students and, and people currently use. And what happens is you focus and you can control the dragon and the more you focus, the better you do in the game. So uh, Jake just launched um, a Kickstarter campaign that successfully was funded. He targeted $100,000 and as you can see here, they raised $138,000. So let's give a round of applause to Jake there. And just uh, three days ago, I believe, Jake was uh, surprised to be named uh, on Forbes 30 under 30 list. So that was also a great achievement, which Tatiana had gotten the previous year. So it's really exciting. Um, I mean, I, I couldn't think of two better coaches uh, to have in the program. Uh, they are absolutely amazing. I, I, I love working with them. I couldn't do what I, I do without them. Yes, he did it. <laughs> That's right. Um, and what ends up happening, and there's, these are just some uh, older photos, is that you know we get to create this group of amazing students. We're trying to build great companies and great entrepreneurs, and we get to spend the year with them. And here's the current class. Here we are at Melissa's office, um, hanging out with her, checking out uh, some some cool toys that she's developed over time and we get to celebrate their success. That's what we're gonna do tonight and hopefully give them a little push uh, and a little bit of funding to um, help them keep going and to, to be successful entrepreneurs. So that's my kind of quick intro into the program for those of you that haven't had a chance to be a part of our program. Uh, just a little bit of stuff on tonight and then I'm gonna turn it over to Tati and Jake to talk a little bit and then I'm gonna let Melissa and Doug say some stuff as well. So tonight, Here's the program, um, here's the format. So first of all, we're gonna show you two alumni uh, startups, alumni of the program, uh, and we're gonna show you kind of how their stories have progressed over time so that you can see that uh, we're not just talking about kind of helping to create great entrepreneurs that, uh, but there's actually been some track record there. The second thing is that uh, we're gonna hear from about six student pitches and those student pitches are gonna be eligible for our active sharks to invest in. Now, you've seen a lot of terminology over email, sharks, active sharks, future sharks, but basically our active sharks tonight have committed to investing $5,000 in at least um, one company tonight. And so after the student pitches, we're gonna let the active sharks go off for about 10 minutes. Uh, we're gonna let them deliberate and make their selections, and then they're gonna come back and announce uh, their, their selection for the night. Um, after that, we're gonna hear from a bunch of alumni, about five alumni teams that are also all raising money. Uh, it's just a chance for them to connect with you so that if you're interested and if you want to learn more about what they're doing, uh, you can connect with them either tonight or in the future, we can help you facilitate that. 
We just want to give them exposure to you so that you get to know them, and who knows, maybe there's a funding opportunity down the line. After that, we're going to do some networking here at the house. We're going to go take a fun group photo up by the front door, and then for those of you that plan to stay with us tonight, we're going to have an after party back at the hotel where you all were. So does that make sense to folks how that's going to work? Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. So with that, I want to turn it over to Jake and Tati because uh, they have been just amazing this year and have spent so many hours um, uh, throughout the year to work with the teams. I just want them to be able to say hi to you. So Jake, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Howie. Howie's instrumental in this program. I think he deserves a round of applause for all the hard work he does. I think, you know, I have Gmail analytics that tell me where I get emails from, and Howie has never been outside of the top three uh, e people that I email with, and I think probably half the people in this room could say the same thing. I don't, I don't know how, how he does it. So Tatiana and I are coaches for the Melissa and Doug program. We started our companies while we were at Duke. Actually, Melissa and Doug were instrumental in helping start a program at Duke that we were involved in called InCube. Uh, we met there. We're actually engaged, um, so that's why I stand so close to her. Um, <laughs> It's, um, and, and so Melissa and Doug are really near to our hearts because they, we found each other through a lot of the initiatives that they put together really early on. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. In fact, in fact I, was, I was curious, when was my first interaction with Tatiana? Because we lived in this group together but didn't really talk to her much. And the only female? Yeah, yeah I, I won. Uh, <laughs> uh, so... so I, I wanted to see when is our first interaction, and so I looked at my email like when the first mention of Tatiana comes up, and there was actually a member of our group said we need to write a thank you letter for, for Melissa, Tatiana, why don't you do it? Um, As the only girl, girls know how to write flowery language, not me. And so Tatiana just said, uh, I, I don't really good, you know, write very well, so uh, Jake. The near at the time. Jake, why don't you do it? So our first interaction was actually over a thank you letter to Melissa. So, um, and that was before we were dating, and um, so that, that was really cool to see. <laughs> one, one of our earliest memories is that first summer, um, we moved into an apartment on campus that was for the entire group, and it had this nasty black-coated ceiling that was like popcorn-y, and we decided we wanted a modern look. And part of the investment was to modernize our um, community space to turn it into an entrepreneurial hub for the university. So we went to Home Depot, bought a bunch of scrapers, and scraped off the ceiling. And uh, then we were moved out of all of our apartments for three weeks because it turns out it was all asbestos that we had <laughs> scraped off. So those were some of our early adventures. <laughs> Love can blossom from asbestos, it turns yeah, yeah. out. Exactly. Um, so, needless to say, we were just so thankful for Melissa and Doug and, and all the resources that Duke gave us and all the mentors that we had. And so, when this program got going, you know, it was so important for us to give back. So many people had spent so many time giving us mentorship and advice and resources, and we wanted to do the same. So, we found that a lot of times the best advice comes from people that aren't the successful superstars, but are a couple years ahead of you, that recently went through what you are currently going through. So as recent uh, Dukies that started our companies only a few years ago while we were in school and are still working on those same companies, we think we're in a good position to give these uh, students advice, not because we're experts, but because we faced a lot of the same challenges and have learned a lot and can hopefully help convey those lessons and have them not repeat the same mistakes and move a lot faster than we did. And I think what you'll hear from the showcase companies and the alumni is that we've done a good job. And a lot of our students that we've mentored have been able to go a lot faster, not repeat those same mistakes, and are surpassing us in a lot of ways, which is the best feeling ever. So um, this is really the program that we wish had existed when we were at Duke and what we tried to create early on. And because of the impact that Melissa and Doug had on our lives and the Duke Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program that was really at its infancy when we were students. This is why we're so connected to the program and want to give back because it's changed the trajectory of our lives, not just from love, but also for our careers and the opportunities that we've had to grow and learn. Um, one of the ma many lessons that we've had along the way is how to keep going. And one of those really important ways is during 
the summer as a student, having the opportunity to work during the whole summer exclusively on your startup idea. This was something that Jake, I, and a couple other people at NQ discovered was the, a critical path to being able to consider entrepreneurship as a full-time career path when we graduated was the necessity to try it out for a summer. And we had the opportunity to do that. I think it was the first time that Duke offered a grant of that type. And we're, we're so glad that the Melissa and Doug Entrepreneurship Program has that as a core component. And today, the demo day is really exciting because it's a culmination of all of the efforts the students have put forth over the past nine months and turning their companies into reality. And most of them, as Jake said, certainly the ones you'll see today are far further along than we were when we stood up and pitched five years ago now in our version of the demo day. Um, the next thing that we realized in the evolution of collegiate entrepreneurs is if you're, if you're at the point where your company is far enough along that you can step away from the university and drop out or you can graduate but want to continue with your company after graduation, typically your company isn't quite far enough along to really be able to attract VC money or um, major angel investment money. So really what a lot of students and us needed as that first step was a friends and family round. And our hope is that the sharks here today will consider that as an opportunity to invest in the highest potential startups coming out of Duke University. And this is, this is really what allows students to continue and drive their companies to the next level and see, see the potential. And I think you'll be really excited to see what they have today. Absolutely. Let's uh, get started. I think Melissa and Doug are going to come next. Hey, Melissa and Doug, can you? You'll speak after. Okay, great. We're jumping right in. So first up is going to be, where did the finder go? Great. Josh. Josh with Farm Shots. Come on up, Josh. Again, this is one of our showcase companies here. So I think I'm up first, because you're supposed to save the best for last. Um, so <laughs> hey, it's, it's good to meet everyone. Howie, how do I go to the next one? What do I do? I space bar? Space bar? OK. <laughs> hey, good to meet everyone. Um, my name is Josh Miller. I'm the founder of Farm Shots. I was in the first class of Melissa and Doug. I had about three cups of coffee before this, so my presentation is going to be pretty quick. Um, so here's where we're at today. Uh, we're doing about 1.1 million in sales uh, for 2017, all contracts signed. Uh, we've done about 500,000 in gap revenue in the first three quarters. We also just launched an international partnership with John Deere uh, to be distributed through all of their dealerships worldwide in Australia, Brazil, the US, and Canada. So what do we actually do? Uh, for those of you that don't know about us, uh, we have three separate products that are currently on the market, one for crops, one for cows, and one for claims, and we're only going into other verticals that start with a C. <laughs> so <laughs> this is our, our first product that came out on the market. Um, this time last year, it did about $100,000 in revenue. Uh, so this is actually, since this deck was made, uh, accrued about 400,000 in revenue. So uh, what this product does is if you're a farmer, normally you spend about 10 bucks per acre walking through your farm looking for these diseases and bugs. What we're able to do off of the satellite imagery is pick out where the diseases and bugs are and tell the farmer where they are, so that way they have to spend less time in the field. We also recently launched a new product uh, that we just signed a $600,000 a year deal with uh, for, with the uh, government of New Zealand. What it does is it measures the volume of grass out in a field for cows to eat uh, and tells the farmer how many cows to put in each pen. Originally, the product was built for sheep, uh, and we had a bunch of jokes about counting sheep and how tiring it was and all that. And then our most recent product, uh, we actually recently started producing something uh, for financial services. So what we're able to do is for these large organizations that give farmers uh, what would be a, a loan, uh, so that way they can go ahead and buy their seed and inputs. We're actually able to monitor all the farmers that they give these loans to and estimate how many of those loans are going to default. So for these large organizations like Rabobank, 
uh, we're able to go ahead and say, hey, we think 5% of your loans are going to default this year because we can see that 5% of your farms are dead. There's nothing growing on out there. That's where we are today. Um, the company had intended to exit later, uh, but we had a strategic reach out with a pretty good offer. Um, not at liberty to talk about who it is yet, but hopefully we'll be closed by the end of the year and I'll be able to talk about it. Cool, that's us. Thank you very much, Josh Arun. Okay, Smart Metals Recycling. Hi, uh, my name is Arun. Uh, I was in the class of 2015 at Duke and class of 2014 in the Melissa and Doug program with Josh. Um, my company is called Smart Metals Recycling. We're an electronic waste recycling company. We started back in 2014, um, kind of right after the Melissa and Duck program, uh, Melissa and Duck summer ended, um, and we bought this facility in Statesville, North Carolina, which is about 40 minutes north of Charlotte. Uh, and when we bought it, it used to be a furniture warehouse that we took over. Um, and you can see what it looks like uh, back in 2014. Um, from then, uh, we've grown on to become a fairly large organization. We have about 120 employees now in two locations. Uh, the second location is in Sacramento, California. Uh, and yeah, so just some photos uh, from, uh, to show what our operations looks like. Um, so now, let me try to get into what, what exactly we do. Uh, so a quick show of hands. How many of you have more than two cell phones lying around at home with no use? I think I see a lot of hands. <laughs> um, so that's, that's kind of the market we're targeting, right? Uh, so we, I, I think the current economy is very take, make, consume, dispose. Um, there is no way to take electronic products at the end of their lives uh, and extract value out of them. Uh, so this is a graph showing how iPhone sales have um, progressed over the last, since 2007, so over the last 10 years. Um, and what's really interesting is uh, Apple made its uh, 300 millionth iPhone about four years ago or sold its 300 million iPhone about four years ago. And today, we have about 300 million iPhones that have been discarded. So it is a huge, huge number of phones that are going away with no value being recovered. Um, and if we, if we had to extrapolate from that, uh, Apple has already sold its one billionth iPhone. So four years from now, we would have, a, have one billion iPhones with nowhere to go or with no value being recovered from them. So that's, uh, that's where we come in. Uh, we try to take those electronic products at the end of their lives uh, and try to get the maximum value out of them. So, you know, the, the last resort is recycling where there's nothing else we can do with these devices. Uh, but more as often as possible, we try to uh, follow the shorter loop. We try to reuse stuff, so less energy is used in the process. Uh, we try to refurbish stuff. Um, so that's, that's, where they are, that's where they are model. Um, so over the last three years, uh, since 2014, uh, we've grown significantly. Um, in 2014, so that's about half a year, was we uh, opened up our location in August. Uh, uh, since then, uh, we're projected to hit 21 million in revenue this year. Uh, can, can we do this event in your house next year? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we're, we're hoping to hit 45 million next year, so we're still growing uh, aggressively. Uh, we're opening up new, new locations. Uh, we're opening up new of uh, verticals. Uh, the latest one is mobility, which is why I wanted to discuss um, what we just discussed. Um, so yeah, um, and this 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 is not an important slide. I just wanted to show you our core key processes at the warehouse, uh, and what really makes us stand apart from our competition is the way we 
uh, manage to find uh, newer and newer ways of um, you know finding recovering value from the products that we get. Uh, so that's the sales side. Uh, so you know uh, my co-founder Shelley, who's also a Duke alum, um, and our, our, the rest of our business development and sales team is often in Shenzhen and Hong Kong. Uh, trying to figure out what it is that they're doing to recover value from these end-of-life products. Uh, and that's what really helps us stay competitive in the game. Um, so yeah, uh, once again, same slide. Uh, four years from now, we expect about, a, about one billion iPhones to hit the market. Uh, and we really, really need a process to um, to take care of all that product. This is the Tesla factory in Nevada. Uh, and this is going to show you that the electronics industry or the end of life electronics industry is growing because the new Tesla cars are, are very much an electronics product. You know, they're not, they're not traditional cars anymore. The electronics industry is growing so big um, uh, with not just increase in manufacturing of existing products, but future products are becoming electronic products as well. Um, yeah, and that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. Okay, so we are moving into our first presentation, and it's gonna be actually Mackenzie. Mackenzie uh, couldn't be here. Uh, her video is a recorded YouTube, but we're gonna put her on FaceTime as well to answer two questions. So the way that the student pitches work, four minute pitch, two minutes of questions from anybody in the audience, okay? It's a little bit hard to see, so you're gonna have to raise your hand and speak up. So here is our first student pitch, Mackenzie Drazen with my resource. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mackenzie Drazen, and I am the CEO and co-founder of MyResource, a platform designed to help match patients to the right mental health care for their individualized needs and preferences. My freshman year of university, I lost my sister Shelby to suicide. When Shelby first reached out for help, my family had no prior experience in mental health and we had no idea where to look for a therapist. Shelby was struggling with an eating disorder, anxiety, and depression. And when we asked our pediatrician where we could find a therapist, she gave us a list of three therapists. The problem was, is that those therapists didn't specialize in all the areas that Shelby needed. We ran into the same problem when we went to the hospital the hospital was unable to refer us to a residential program that met all of Shelby's needs. They could treat her anxiety and depression and suicidal thoughts, but they weren't able to treat her eating disorder. And we ended up back in the hospital again to treat just her eating disorder this time. We failed to find Shelby the right resources, but it wasn't from a lack of trying. The system was not able to help us find the right care for Shelby. I spent the next two years learning everything I could about why we weren't able to find Shelby the right care. Why wasn't the hospital able to help refer us when one in four Americans struggle with a mental health condition at some point in their life? And 50% of those struggle with not just one condition but multiple conditions like Shelby. What I learned is that in order to make a good match between patient and provider, there's so many variables you have to keep track of. That includes what insurance does the provider accept, what conditions do they treat? Which modalities do they use to treat those conditions? And that information changes frequently with mental health providers. So it becomes extremely hard to keep track of lists of hundreds and even thousands of therapists, um, which is why hospitals aren't able to do this. They lack the infrastructure. My resource helps provide this infrastructure to health institutions and university counseling centers to allow them to be able to search their list of therapists to find the right resource for their students and for their patients, no matter how diverse their needs are. My resource is currently working with Duke University Counseling Center, Montclair State University Counseling Center, and James Madison University Counseling Center to match their students to the right mental health providers for their needs. My resource has gained over $5,000 in revenue in the past few months since we launched this past May. In order to get to a place where we can help match anyone from anywhere to the right mental health therapist from the comfort of their own home, we are starting with university counseling centers so that we can populate our database with high quality providers and test it in regional areas. We'll then move on to helping hospitals and insurance companies help match their patients to the right care for their individualized needs. 
We are extremely lucky to have an incredible team of people on our team. My co-founder, Gabriella Astorius, Jeremy Lang, our chief software engineer, Rob Rapley, our statistician, and an incredible board of advisors, including Dr. Helen Egger, who is the head of adolescent psychiatry at the NYU Lagoon Center. We are raising $100,000 to help scale up our setup process, as well as refine our marketing strategy so that we can help people like my sister find the right care before it's too late. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're gonna, thank you. We're gonna hang up on Mackenzie and I'm gonna call Mackenzie from FaceTime here. I hope this works. Okay, hello Mackenzie, you are Hi, live Ari. with everybody. And uh, can we take a couple questions from the audience? Oh, I think we're good, it's too bright. Yes, question, go ahead and shout it out. So what's unique about the directory? Is there any software or an algorithm? What, what's unique about your service? So what's unique about the directory? Is there some sort of novel software or something like that? Sure, so we are the only software that allows um, the, pro the actual providers to have control over their own profiles, which allows us to keep the information up to date on a regular basis. Um, we are also the only software that has multiple filters that meet all of patients' criteria. Um, the other existing software out there only allows you to filter by a few criteria. Great, I think we have time for one more question. Yes, shout it out. So um, are you charging the patient or the therapist or both? Are you charging the patient or the therapist or both? We are charging neither, actually. We are charging the health institutions, so the hospitals as well as the university counseling centers, a licensing fee to use the software. Well, that was a quick answer. So do we have one more question out there? Anybody? Anybody? No? Okay. Mackenzie, thank you so much. And thank you so much, Howie. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Okay, next up is Arjun. Hey everyone, I'm Arjun and I co-founded Nebula Learning with my friend Vishnu. We're trying to make sure that every student has the opportunity to, to fall in love with STEM. And the reason we're doing this is because right now, only 16% of American high school seniors are both able to and interested in pursuing a STEM career. And this is a real problem that schools are trying to solve. After talking with a number of teachers and other educational professionals, we decided this was the issue that we wanted to attack. And the way we wanted to do it is by creating this web platform. And this web platform basically takes every unit of the standardized math curriculum, which in most schools is the Common Core curriculum, and puts it into the context of a topic that actually piques students' interests. Real world applications like medical procedures, space exploration, rainforest conservation, and even running a chocolate factory. Along the way, students are able to pick up cool and important STEM skills. Here in this example, you can see a bit of coding. In other examples, we have problem decomposition, data analysis. And the way that students interact with the platform is through this chat system that you can see on the side here. It kind of looks like iMessage. So basically, the students are able to interact with the suite of virtual characters who are all powered by our in-house machine learning algorithms, who are able to provide feedback to the students. They're able to answer all the students' questions and they're able to adapt the content to the student's individual needs. So if a student doesn't understand a topic, we're able to provide them with the, the remediation and any other auxiliary topics that'll help them understand what's being taught in class. So far, we've done seven pilot programs across the country with over 500 middle school students, and students loved it. Here's an example of some data from before using the Nebula platform in a seventh grade statistics classroom. These were the test scores beforehand, and they dramatically improved afterwards. Based on the feedback that we got from both the students and the teachers, as well as research from a number of educational research institutions, we found that conversational one-on-one -on -one learning was the best way to keep students engaged, and that's why we wanted to create this interactive platform. Most educational technology out there follows a linear progression, and what it essentially amounts to is a digital textbook. You learn one topic, and then you learn the next topic, and so on and so forth. But on the Nebula platform, you can choose the path that's right for you, so you're able to have an individual, personalized learning experience. The edtech market has grown rapidly over the past five years. Education is expected to be the next industry to undergo a digital transformation, and over $2 billion were spent on middle school instructional support in 2014 alone. 
To enter this market, we plan to sell annual software subscriptions to schools, and that allows the school to onboard as many students as they want, have access to all of our content, updates, technical and content-related support, and professional development for the teachers. So far, we have over 30 teachers who are interested in this product, and they've all asked us for pilots to use our program, and we plan to transition those into sales in the future. We're currently in the process of raising $250,000 for product development and marketing over the next 12 months. At the end of that time period, we want to have the entire Common Core Math 7 curriculum finished and ready to launch by the fall 2018 school year in 10 school districts. This is a picture of me and my co-founder, Vishnu. We're both seniors at Duke right now, but we're coming into this with a ton of startup experience. We both ran Duke's on-campus startup incubator for two years, and we also worked at FarmShots, who presented earlier. We worked at them while they were going through the Y Combinator Accelerator program, getting a lot of sales and development experience in the process. We were also both majoring in STEM careers, so we're intimate with STEM education, and we've also been volunteering at local middle schools for the past year to gain a thorough understanding of our market. We think we're the right people for this job, and here are a bunch of teacher and student testimonials that we've gotten to help support our case. Thank you. Okay, two minutes for questions. Raise your hand, Gary. Um, so, have you considered being a not-for-profit, seeking donations and offering the, uh, the platform for uh, close to zero? Because, uh, Khan Academy is an example of that. Um, we have considered it, but we found that a lot of edtech software kind of falls prey to the fact that they make the content and the software available, but then they don't do enough to actually support it in school, so then schools end up not using it. So we want to be able to support, like, teacher support, professional development, actually have a team of people who are there for the teachers consistently, and that seemed more in keeping with a for-profit model. Thanks. Yes. So STEM is a vast uh, range of subjects. Uh, and what do you have? What do you not have? Uh, or why does it go down? Okay. Um, I think the, the core STEM competencies that we've been focusing on in our platform, sorry, are um, coding and data analysis, data visualization. Those are three that we thought were really like overarching and applied to a lot of different fields. But within that, we're just trying to really focus on STEM applications that students find interesting. So we've been interviewing students and finding stuff that they actually like and just trying to build our lessons around that. Okay, we have time for one more question. Yes, Frank. Who's the, the buyer for this and, and who's involved in the purchase process? Absolutely. Sorry, what was the last part of your question? Sure, absolutely. So we sell annual software subscriptions to schools, and though the education landscape is a little bit different depending on whether it's a private school or a charter school or a public school, usually the principal is the person who has both the discretionary spending power to actually purchase products on the entire school level, as well as to have an intimate relationship with both the teachers and the students and to understand what they need. So sometimes it's at the district level, sometimes it's at the teacher level, but primarily the principal is the one who purchases the product. Thank you guys. Let's give Thank you so much. Applause. Thank you. Next up is Peer Connect. Frank on deck. Hi everyone. My name is Ray Liu, and I'm the founder and CEO of Peer Connect. We're building great, healthy, and collaborative learning environments at high schools by licensing an innovative peer tutoring platform solution to high schools. Right now, I'm excited to say that we already have two paying schools signed on. So we all know that high school is very stressful for students. In fact, recent studies are saying that one in two high school students face a great deal of stress daily, and one in four have diagnosable depression. As a high school student, I fell under both of these categories, and I'm here to solve that problem. With peer tutoring, so peer tutoring is a concept of connecting student tutors with student learners in a way that's very mutually beneficial for both sides. So in this way, a student learner can get the help that they need from a peer that attends the same school as them, might have even had the same class from the exact same teacher, and this paves the way for a lot of social and emotional connections that just aren't possible with traditional paid adult tutoring. Overall, this serves to foster a healthy and collaborative learning environment within the school in the face of this competition and stress going on in high schools. 
So if peer tutoring is such a great solution for the competition and stress going on in high schools, then why don't we see great peer tutoring programs going on in every single high school out there? Well, the problem is that running a peer tutoring program is actually very expensive and labor intensive. In fact, Principal Tim Corrigan from Ch uh, Chattahoochee High School has said that their high school has tried running peer tutoring programs in the past. They just haven't been, get it, been able to get it off the ground because of these challenges. That's where Peer Connect comes in. So we're an online platform where we let student tutors and student learners connect. So here's how it works. If I were a learner and I wanted help in, let's say, Algebra 1, I can go on our student platform and look at a list of suggested tutors and quickly send a request to a tutor and schedule a time to meet with them. In addition, my teachers will know exactly what's going on and be able to see all the um, statistics and activity going on on the platform. And our schools are loving Peer Connect. So we're getting a lot of feedback from the students and the teachers saying the platform is very easy to use and that students are getting help that they otherwise wouldn't be able to get. And more importantly, we found that actually 80% of the users reported a stronger sense of community and collaboration through using the platform. So right now we have two paying schools um, that are paying with our software as a service business. And our first school is Woodward Academy. Um, they actually liked their experience so much that they recommended us to our second school, Chattahoochee. And through these two schools, um, sign up on yearly contracts, we have over 4,500 in revenue to date. And through our two schools, we actually have over 180 users, and that's 180 um, more users getting help. And then in addition, we also have a pipeline of 35 schools that we hope to sign on for the following school year. So at Peer Connect, we believe we're truly uh, finding a truly revolutionary way of tackling peer tutoring. So right now, um, we're offering peer-to-peer -peer software where students can get free and personalized help, whereas current competitors out there like Chegg and Wizen, that's for paid adult tutoring on an online platform. And as I already mentioned, traditional school peer-to-peer -peer pro peer -peer programs are very expensive and labor-intensive. Today, we're looking to raise 50K. So the way the education sales cycle works is that this upcoming spring 2018 will be the prime time to sign schools for the upcoming school year. So we really want to ramp up our development and marketing to get ready for that. So from the development standpoint, we want to, we want to be ready to scale and we want to be bringing out new features that our schools are asking us to build. And in addition, in marketing, we want to hire one account manager to be able to manage um, and provide a great experience to all these schools. Um, our ultimate goal by the end of 2018 is to sign 25 schools. And in conclusion, um, high school is very stressful right now, and peer tutoring programs out there are very expensive and inefficient. And we hope you'll join us on our journey to help these schools and help these students all across the nation. Thank you. Students for questions. Yes, Laura. So can students tutor across schools and you only have tutors who are from your same school? Right, so right now um, we're doing, we're licensing two schools, so it would be um, within the same school. And the idea is that there are all, all these benefits um, where the students are from the same school and they can, you know, maybe even have the, be from the same class, from the same teacher. And then there's a lot of bonding that could happen and just general understanding and common ground between the students. And overall that serves to foster a healthy and collaborative learning environment. Next question. Yes. Right. So the, of the two schools you have, right. what, what would they say is like the biggest challenge Right, so yeah, our two schools are a little bit different. So our first school, actually, they had peer tutoring um, initially, but it was very inefficient. So we're helping, making, or we're helping to make it a lot more efficient, and everybody's saying it's a lot easier. With Chattahoochee, our second school, they actually didn't have peer tutoring. But in general, they're both saying um, some new features like um, teacher tracking, so allowing the teachers to you know, keep track of you know, the progress in relation to you know, the tutor. And then also tutor training, to, and we're planning on building online modules so that all the tutors are vetted, so that all the training processes, um, you know, all the tutoring sessions, sorry, um, have just quality tutoring going on in them. One more question. I see two hands in front of you. So, as you said, very quickly, you're still busy right now. Right. So, what is the benefit to students offering your services? Right, that's a great question. So, right now, um, the tutors at both schools are getting um, compensated in the form of service hours and then all, um, also in the form of graduation requirements. So, like a lot of schools out there already have like ser a community service requirements that uh, students have to fulfill. So the problem isn't necessarily that we aren't getting enough tutors, it's that a lot of schools already are trying to do this and they have all the structure in place. It's just that they, aren't ha they don't have a very efficient way of doing it and that's the platform that we're providing to make their lives easier.
Thank you. Okay, next up is Inspect X. Hi, my name is Frank Kaserik, and I'm the CEO and founder of InspectX. We're a network of mechanics who inspect cars for private buyers. I'd like to tell you a story about a 1983 Porsche 911 for sale in New Jersey. Now, at first glance, this car looks gorgeous. The paint's in great condition, and so are the tires. And it was nice enough to attract the attention of a buyer from Los Angeles. When that buyer asked the dealership representing the car for more information, they assured him that it was a beautiful car, that it had recent paintwork. They told him that it ran smoothly and without smoke, which is a huge problem for these cars. And most importantly, they assured him that the car had absolutely no accident history, to their knowledge. And that's where we came in. This buyer asked us to send our Porsche specialist in New Jersey out to the car for a full mechanical and cosmetic inspection. And that technician told a very different story. Not only did he find that the entire car had been repainted due to an accident, but he found actual wires hanging down from the car's undercarriage and a golf ball sized hole in the rear bumper. He even stated that he did not feel safe road testing the vehicle given the condition of the engine. And he described the wiring controlling the electricals as a rat's nest. Now, fortunately, because of our inspection, this buyer walked away from the car, saving himself from potentially a $35,000 mistake. And I'm incredibly proud to report that we've provided the same level of inspection to over 30 other buyers to the tune of over $12,000 in revenue collected. But this situation happens all the time. There is a huge level of information asymmetry between a used car buyer and a used car seller. And breaking down that information gap is really tough, especially if you're buying a car remotely. And so that's why we want our technicians to be the inter intermediaries between those two parties, giving a, an interested buyer all of the information they could possibly want to decide whether they should move forward with the car or walk away. And so far, our traction has been really promising. We have over $12,000 in revenue collected and over 70 mechanics committed to our network, which has meant that we've completed 35 inspections to date. But I know that we can help even more used car buyers if we can automate our manual inspection scheduling process, in addition to providing some logical companion services like title transfer and easy shipping. And so I'm asking for $75,000 today to do just that. First and foremost, I want to automate our inspection scheduling process. Right now, as I said, I make all of these uh, matches between buyer and mechanic entirely manually. And to be honest, I can't keep up with the demand. In addition, we're going to add direct integration with a shipping partner and an escrow service, uh, both, of what should, both of which should increase uh, a customer's value to us in, in the long run. In addition, we're going to ramp up advertising on enthusiast car forums. And finally, we're going to expand our technician recruitment funnel to the point where we can inspect any car located anywhere in the United States. And finally, I'm incredibly excited to report that we've already shipped our first car from St. Louis to Los Angeles. And I can't wait to make an even greater dent on this market. I hope that you'll join me. Thank you. Yes, so the answer is yes to both questions. Uh, about 90% of our technicians come from Porsche and BMW dealerships. Um, so they're already master technicians as assessed by the factory. Um, and in addition to that, I get on the phone with every one of them. Uh, I, I vet them, give them a little technical quiz, and ask them to send me uh, 
evidence of all of their documentation uh, through, the, through the manufacturers. Um, the second part of your question, yes, um, our technicians are nationwide. I've assembled the network to basically model uh, the largest markets for used Porsche and BMW sales. So we're able to get on uh, the majority of that volume uh, that's already transacting in the private party space. Question, yes. How do you think the Well, so we provide um, a 200-point inspection checklist. We provide all the logistics around contacting the seller, contacting the technician, um, kind of making that environment uh, you know, very easy for, for the inspection to happen. Um, so there's a lot of value created in uh, just sort of managing that process and also standardizing the inspection protocol. Um, and then I also, a lot of times, jump on the phone with these sellers and help them uh, sort of, uh, you know, in, in a hand-holding way, digest the findings of their report. So it would be a lot more difficult for them to just circumvent me. Last one. Okay. Uh, is there useful information that can be found by looking up the vehicle identification number uh, in terms of uh, whether they're in accidents and, and so forth? Yes, definitely. And actually, because a lot of our technicians work at dealerships, uh, sometimes before a job happens, I'll send them the VIN number and they'll run it through their system and see, um, you know, has the car been, been serviced recently? Has it been serviced regularly through a dealership? So um, there's certainly that, and I would say, uh, you know, Carfax provides a great uh, service in terms of, um, you know, accident history, but uh, we, we also, you know, can, can look at the car in person, see if there's frame damage, uh, accident history there, and, and sort of, you know, validate that claim or, or disprove what, what Carfax is saying. Thanks very much, Frank. Mm -hmm. Next up is ungraded produce. Hi everyone, my name is Courtney Bell and I'm the president of Ungraded Produce, which is a produce delivery service that fights food waste and food accessibility issues. Ungraded Produce exists to address major inefficiencies in the farm to consumer pipeline. Specifically, each year, 52% of the fruits and vegetables grown in America get left in the fields or are diverted to landfills, oftentimes just because they're in excess or ugly, meaning that they're atypically sized, shaped, or colored, but otherwise have no quality issues. From there, this produce rots and generates environmentally degrading greenhouse gases. But meanwhile, there is a high demand for low-cost, high-quality produce, and over 40 million Americans lack access to a convenient and affordable source. So what started as a social mission between two sorority sisters to address food waste and food insecurity soon evolved into a business. Early on, my business partner and I met with many farmers and determined that we could connect consumers with a supply of underutilized, ugly, and excess produce in a for-profit model. And this discovery motivated us to start Ungraded Produce our junior year at Duke. So Ungraded Produce is a subscription-based produce delivery service with an unconventional sourcing model. Because we're primarily sourcing ugly and excess produce that might otherwise go unsold, we have determined that we can help the average American household save about $250 per year on their pr produce. We took the contents of one of our 15 pound mixed box produce boxes recently, that's 10 pounds of veggies, five pounds of fruit, and compared our price with that of Walmart, and found our price to be 32% lower than the Walmart alternative, and that doesn't even account for the fact that uh, our price, our cost of delivery is baked into the price of our product. But in addition to our prices, our customers love that our produce has character, that we've revolutionized their grocery shopping experience, and that we are providing them with an easy way to participate in the fight against food waste. And you can't put a price on those feelings. Consumers today are seeking out the most convenient options on the market. For that reason, online grocery delivery services such as Instacart are projected to capture 20% of the market share in the next decade. And because people still want home-cooked meals, Meal kit delivery services like HelloFresh have dramatically increased their presence. So as the food delivery industry is constantly innovating and growing, consumers are looking to reap the benefits as well while shopping for their produce. And I'm happy to report that Ungraded Produce is here to deliver to those demands. In addition to being a low cost and convenient option, we are delivering the fresh produce needed as the foundation of home cooked meals and are providing our customers with weekly information about where their food is sourced from. So we've uh, quadrupled in growth since rolling out our general launch in May. 
we currently have about 270 customers in the Triangle area, do roughly $10,000 in monthly sales, and have recovered over 11,000 pounds of ugly and excess produce to date. And we were also recently named the winners of the 2017 Duke Startup Challenge and awarded a $50,000 prize. So we have grown our company with remarkably little capital input, but have reached the stage of growth where any significant expansion will definitely require outside funds. We can't keep up with current demand, but with $100,000, we've determined that we will be able to strengthen our internal processes by investing in improved e-commerce and delivery software to automate logistics, as well as by hiring additional staff to accommodate for up to 1,000 subscribers. The money we won from the Startup Challenge will play an integral role in our scaling efforts, but additional funds will help us pursue some much needed marketing campaigns, as well as um, in transition into a larger packaging facility. With our time freed up, we'll be able to devote more energy to expansion efforts. If we can perfect this model in the triangle, we believe it'll be successful throughout the state, region, and eventually the country. Thank you. Two minutes for questions. Yes, Dan. How ugly is ugly? I can hear you, I'm sorry. How ugly is ugly? Do you have an example? Yeah, well, so ugly is anything that, it can be anything that's from a totally misshapen product, such as this eggplant that looks like Pinocchio or this strawberry that looks like a lip, um, to anything that is just a little bit too big, like a zucchini that's too large, and you would think that it's totally perfect and ask why it's ugly. So it's a large range. That question reminds me of um, what Melissa asked me when I called her for our first date. <laughs> uh, I see Chef here, I see Laura. Chef, what's your, uh, what's your Um, so, so far we've relied on organic growth. We haven't invested a cent in marketing, but have relied on our customers to spread the word. Um, and it's been really effective um, this summer alone while working with a predominantly adult residential group in the tri triangle. 75% of our growth alone came from word of mouth referrals. Um, and retention rate has been really awesome. We primarily do work with the re you know, residents and we found that the retention rate has been over 80%. Um, we also work with students. Um, we have products tailored to their needs, and the retention's a little lower because, you know, um, they're oftentimes not in their dorms, but um, we've still found the retention to be about 60%. Great. I see Laura, maybe Mark. Laura. What's the distribution model that's driving, then? Mm -hmm. how do you scale this nationally? Yeah, so obviously we're focused on the triangle at first and getting the model right. Um, for distribution, um, you know, it's very logistically complicated, and we do con you know, hire drivers to you know, make the deliveries happen. So it would just be a matter of contracting out drivers in a similar model to Uber. Um, and as we scale to other locations um, and you know, connect with the right suppliers, it'll also be a rinse and repeat situation of you know, finding the right, you know, contracting out more drivers. So. Sorry, Mark, we're out of time. But thank you, Courtney. Mm -hmm. Next up is Zephyr Mobility. I just want to say I've been a customer of Courtney's for several months now, and I'm a very satisfied customer. So thanks, Courtney. All right, well, hello. Uh, my name is Sam Fox, and my company, Zephyr Mobility, is developing a new device for lifting and moving patients in the hospital. Moving patients is a widespread problem across healthcare. Every day in over a million rooms, nurses have to move and reposition patients every two hours to avoid skin breakdown, which can add up to $45,000 per hospitalization. However, the limitations of current methods, as you can see in this photo, um, adds over $30 billion in direct and indirect cost to the US healthcare system each year. And this is mainly through patient injuries, caregiver back injuries, and skin breakdown, as I mentioned. Um, so we've developed a new technology that is more labor efficient and reduces these risks of injury. This next slide shows how our technology would work in the clinic to reposition patients in bed. So you can see that the patients start slouched forward and then our tubes scoop them up and slide them up the bed and then retract. Um, and the key benefits here are that it only requires one caregiver as opposed to two or more. And there's no back strain on the caregiver which reduces the risk of back injury as I mentioned. So how does this work? How do we scoop onto the patient like this? And, and that's the core technology that we've developed. Um, here you can see an inflatable tube that as we put air into it, it expands under the patient and gently lifts them up with no shearing forces. 
Uh, we filed a provisional patent on this technology, and we're currently working to build an advanced prototype uh, that we can field test in the clinic. There are three main benefits to this solution. First is that it reduce, reduces patient falls and injuries. Second of all, it reduces the back strain, reducing caregiver injuries. And finally, it's fast and easy to use for caregivers and is much more labor efficient, thereby making it much easier to meet the two-hour gold standard of repositioning patients and preventing skin breakdown. This is a large and growing market with hospital systems as our primary customer. We estimate an uh, annual market opportunity of over $400 million just in the US, and this number is only gonna rise with rising obesity rates and an aging population. So we're very excited about a potential uh, a partnership opportunity with Duke University Hospital in Durham. Uh, two months ago, we gave a successful pitch directly to the leadership of this institution, and eight of them reached out to express interest in a field testing partnership. Um, so this would involve working directly with their nurses in their facilities to develop this product and refine our prototypes. Uh, and if that all goes well, they would potentially be a first customer, um, and they're a big one as well. So we're asking for $200,000 to build an advanced prototype that we would use for these field tests. Uh, once we can show that it's uh, safe and effective, we would then launch a seed round of one to four million and bring this product to market. We have an opportunity to bring a new technology to a very old problem with a very crude existing solution. We have an opportunity to save nurses' backs from injury and to improve patient outcomes through timely repositioning. That's what we're trying to do at Zephyr Mobility, and we hope you'll join us in making patient handling safer and simpler. Thank you. How do hospitals pay for this solution? I guess how do you do it well? Yeah, so right now we're thinking uh, of a consumable model, so Razor Razor Blade. Uh, we provide the device up front, it installs on their bed, uh, and then they have to use or a disposable component um, that's for sanitary reasons, infection control, um, and then it's a recurring revenue stream from there. Another question. Yes, on it. What is the cost to produce? So that's a great question. So we're still, I think that's one big question that we're trying to answer with uh, the, building this advanced prototype. Um, right now, we, we think it's somewhere in the $500 to $1,000 range. Um, but, but again, that's you know, just kind of a preliminary, I'd say that's a pretty conservative on the high end estimate also. Um, and we really think that the consumables will be very cheap because it's, it's really just a, a sheet of paper basically. Um, and so the consumables are, are the lowest cost part of it. Definitely, so this will probably be FDA class one, that's what we think it, it will be. Uh, maybe class two, but we really think class one, and they would really just have to show safety, um, safety testing, and that, that would be part of what we do with Duke Health. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, various other uh, medical device, or excuse me, just basic, you know, kind of electrical standards, um, but really FDA is, is the main one there, so. Last question, Arthur. Can somebody in here help me understand Yeah, right. So uh, I've been an advisor Sam. I've launched two successful metal and flux companies just to give you background. Um, this is going to be a flux one device. What Sam is going to have to report to the FDA is that he follows good manufacturing processes and they've been designed under a specific set of design requirements that are specified by international bodies. So this is, to say this is FDA, it's true technically legally, but in fact, He's providing documentation to the FDA to manufacture it properly and to design it properly. Cool. Bill and Rob, let's have you go back to the sharks. Thank you, Sam. Great. Okay, this next presentation is our last student presentation, and then we're going to adjourn for a 10 minute break. Next up is Relief. Good evening, everyone. My name is Uzo. I'm the founder of Relief. And we're fixing business to business trade in Nigerian agriculture. By 2050, Nigeria will be the third most populous country in the world, eclipsing the United States. And currently, one million Nigerians die every year uh, due to food security related issues. If this problem is not fixed uh, very soon, there will be a serious crisis in the country. And we're tackling food security from a value chain perspective. So business to business trade is broken in Nigeria. Uh, suppliers lack working capital to mobilize the supply. What this looks like, what, what this looks like 
It supplies, take capital from farmers. They can't pay enough farmers to then get enough uh, produce and then move it to the point of sale. And so 23% of deals are not going through because of this. Buyers then have an issue meeting their demand and the amount of fragmentation in the market means there is a huge gap between the supply and the demand. Our first key insight is that we are able to access who the suppliers are selling to when we offer to finance the deals. Typically, suppliers are extremely guarded about who they are getting their contracts from. But when we offer to give them working capital to move their deals forward, we get access to the demand. The second key insight is that because we are offering profit sharing as the way we make our returns, then the suppliers become partners. So instead of charging interest rates as banks do, they charge up to 30%, which makes the capital completely inaccessible, we are incentivized to make the deal go through, and we take 60 to 80% of the profits from these deals. The third and most important insight is that trade finance is only an entry point into the supply chain. Over time, we'll be able to intimately understand the suppliers from the farm gates all the way to the point of sale and make these supply chains very efficient and productive. So this idea is very new. In the last two weeks, we've been able to build up 14 deals of cumulative value of $1.6 million. And just this past Wednesday, we were able to finish our first successful deal before flying over here. We've made about $5,800 in revenue from this deal, $300 in profit, about a 5% ROI, and we had, that, we had a five-day turnaround time there. How it works is that we have a supply base of about 2,000 suppliers from our previous product. They upload their local purchase orders and the international contracts. We then assess these, the risk of these contracts on a variety of criteria. We choose a deal to finance, and we take the money with a local agent who works with the supplier. We then, along the way, monitor points of breakage in the supply chain and build the same relationships with these suppliers and who they're getting uh, their produce from over time. So the market size for just soya beans, is what, which is what we're starting in, is $650 million. But the much larger market, obviously, is Nigerian agriculture, which is about $100 billion. We're raising 200000 to expand our agent network, as well as look into uh, capitalizing international deals and also work uh, to build our own tracking system. By the halfway point of next year, we want to have built up around 30 deals with a quarter million dollars uh, in sales, and finally form our first relief controlled supply chain. Uh, we have a very strong team that has been working in Nigerian agriculture for collectively six years. We come from technical and consulting backgrounds. We are advised by the Nobel Food Prize winner and the president of the African Development Bank, and we just finished Y Combinator this summer. So in short, we are relief. We're fixing business to business trade in Nigeria. We're providing trade financing as an entry point to create efficient trade networks in Nigerian agriculture. We have $5,000 in revenue in two weeks. We're playing in a large growing market, and we have a very strong team who's committed to solving this problem. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, we started in soya beans. So one of the most important things is the quality standards. Um, Soybeans, it's just moisture um, and then impurities, so you can very easily get a moisture test. So the risk uh, when we get these contracts is what crop is it, what is the likelihood that it would meet the quality standard, and how experienced is the buyer in working in those communities? Because just from the experience from this first deal, when you're working with a farmer you've never worked with and you don't actually know his like, farming standards, um, the risk is much higher. So we, we choose the crop based on the likelihood that it would get rejected. Um, then we look at how experienced is this trader in working with those farming communities. Question on the left, Monica. Oh, no. We, we did think about uh, working with some of the existing lending companies to structure some profit sharing between us uh, so we don't have to use our own capital to run, run the, the financing deal. So we're looking at alternative uh, ways to finance some of those, those deals because we, our end game is not to become a trade financer, 
but to understand the value chain and get rid of all the middlemen in the chain and make it more efficient. And he went through Y Combinator this past summer and has some of that funding as well. Yeah. Your last question. Okay, so it'll be about a 10 minute break. Please feel free to stretch. Uh, there are plenty of restrooms. Maybe we can have some folks guide them to the restrooms. If you are a, an active shark and you are committed to investing, uh, please go upstairs. Uh, Ryan, I hope you'll join. Uh, Monica, I hope you'll take them. Jake and Tati will join. Steve, Bill, Rob, I hope you'll join as well. If you are a future shark, but maybe you've been inspired and you're actually thinking of maybe investing tonight, please feel free to join in on that discussion as well and uh, everybody else can just relax. Okay, so uh, Arthur, do you mind being first? Sure. Okay, and if you're called, I hope you don't mind just coming up and saying hi to Arthur. Well, the lights are really something in here, everybody. Um, I have to mention that I did not go to Duke, but my wife Paige did, and that's how I get to be here this evening. I uh, have to also mention that 30 years ago, I was at the hospital for special surgery having uh, uh, therapy done on my knee after surgery and uh, the Sunday before the score was reversed and my therapist had Yukon on his t-shirt and I had Duke on mine and he straightened my knee out so uh, just remember what you wear to therapy everybody uh, in any event I would like to uh, make three investments um, the first with um, uh, the first with Sam Um, and the second uh, with Courtney, and then the third, I'm not gonna say your name properly, uh, with uh, uh, um, Nebula. 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 So in any event. Um, Let's take a quick photo, come on up here, Sam. Come on up, quick photo with Arthur. Come on up, see him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arthur. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Can I have your list of the names? Yeah. I'm not going to remember. It's hard to see. I might say the businesses instead of the names, if that's okay. Uh, so I'm Amanda Freeman. I graduated in 98 from Duke, uh, and I'm a fellow entrepreneur. Uh, so I admire what you're all doing and really respect that you're doing it so young because uh, I know I definitely wasn't thinking about it while I was in college and it's awesome that you have the opportunity and that you guys are all really taking advantage of it. I'm also going to do three investments uh, with InspectX. <laughs> Zephyr Mobility and Relief. Thank you so much. I'll take Thanks these so from you, and I'll take a quick photo of you. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One, two, three. One, two, three. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And before we let Jim choose, in case anybody was wondering what was uh, taking so long, I think the Sharks conversation was just so so involved and energetic and they wanted to just know so much more about all the companies that that's what happened is they just kept on asking questions and we, we wanted to let them know as much as possible about all the companies. All right, Jim. Hi everybody, Jim Chu here. It's so exciting to oh, see all oh. these young people that's uh, really thinking ahead and making such a great uh, contribution both in building the business and also social causes. So I'm making two investments today. One is with Ray Liu and... <laughs> And I, I really, really impressed with this young man, and uh, he, he really came a long way, and, and the, the Peer Connect platform itself, uh, it also feels like there's a strong social cause in terms of, you know, helping students finding each other and, and really improve the education across the board. So that's, that's the reason um, I want to put some money into Ray's cause. And also with Sam, As a CTO, this is a great technology that we have to see it to market. So uh, these are these are two of my choices. Congratulations. Thank you, Jim. Very good. Thank you. Next up is Ezra. 
Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm uh, Ezra Kuchar, and this is my daughter, Alexandra. I'm, uh, I, I have a kind of a weird distinction. I'm the EIR of the Innovation Entrepreneurship Program at Duke. Uh, and uh, when I was a grad student at Duke in 1995, I started a media company um, that we ended up selling, um, I guess, uh, probably about seven years later to NBC Sports uh, Digital Division. So. I, I know what it's like to start a company while, while at Duke, and it was, a, it was a wild ride. So we're gonna make two investments. Um, first, having a, uh, a middle schooler who you know, needs some help with STEM, we're gonna do Nebula. So, and then additionally, we're gonna do uh, Relief also. So, come on, come on. <laughs> so Thank you so much. All right, come on, why, why don't you guys put you on the side so we can get a picture. Hey, congratulations. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Connor Crown. I'm here along with one of my business partners, uh, Ked Faseha. Uh, we're one of four Duke graduates who actually started our investment company about two and a half years ago. One of our partners who couldn't be here today actually won a national championship for the Duke basketball team, Mason Plumley. so this, he should have been here. <laughs> um, first of all, congratulations to all you guys. This was, this was incredible. Um, unfortunately, the investment that we're making today, she couldn't be here today, but it's uh, Mackenzie at My Health. <laughs> Thank you, Connor. All right, next up is Monik. Thanks, guys. Uh, my name is Monik Bond. I graduated Duke in, in 2009 um, and uh, kind of went through a bunch of industries, finance, and eventually found tech um, and have been working in tech for the last seven or eight years. Um, and really like a lot of the things that, that you guys are doing. I think it's some really impressive companies here, a lot of creativity, a lot of ingenuity. Uh, and a lot of this stuff is, is high, like super contemporary, and, and I'm excited to see where all this goes. Um, so there are three companies that I will be investing in personally, and one on behalf of my co-founder. Um, so four. The first uh, is Courtney, with, uh, yeah. And I, I, I think this kind of thinking is amazing. Um, there's a lot of people that put a lot of capital into, into businesses um, currently that are looking for ways to uh, improve nutrition and access to, to, um, to food, this is a really creative way to do that in a way that I'm, a lot of people haven't really been thinking about. And um, I'm, there's a, a supply chain that exists and, and I'm confident that there's gonna be a lot of margin opportunity and a way for you to grow it very quickly. Um, and so to the extent that I can help uh, with digital marketing and Google search and things like that, I'd be more than happy to. Uh, so, so that's the first. The second one is InspectX. We actually, um, both are rowers. He looks much more like he's a rower uh, than, than, than myself. I did it for two years, you did it for? It's my second year. Second year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he'll probably make it to three and four too, so. Um, but this is a cool company, and I, I think um, with, with the way that Google works and, and digital marketing works, I think it's something that you can blow out very quickly. Uh, I've done this in a number of, of verticals now, and I'm pretty confident that I can help you do it. Um, so I'd like this to take my investment and just let's blow it on marketing and let's see if we can make it much bigger. Um, so I'm excited about it. I think it's really cool. I've never bought a used car before, so you'll have to teach me a little bit more about it. Have it out. Have it yeah. out. Um, I take a lot of Ubers, but and sorry. And then the the third one is is relief. And yeah. um, one of the things that I thought was really exciting that. Uh, I, I would have loved to, to hear you sort of deliver more is when you said that there's a 5% a margin that you guys made or 5% or interest rate that occurred in five days. Yeah. So five days, <laughs> um, my bank account doesn't even get 1% a year, right? 5% in five days is absurd. So that's an incredibly high IRR business. And if you can deploy capital efficiently and, and pick good deals, even if there's a loss factor and you invest in some, some dud soybeans, yeah. you're good. Uh, so. That's uh, that sort of accelerant. I've, in a couple spaces in real estate, I've seen this work really well. If you can get good deals in your industry, if you can get good deals like this, you can go and buy two trucks, becomes four trucks, becomes ten trucks, and you can just dominate the entire supply chain, vertically integrate it, and then just you know go into the sunset. So it's pretty sweet, man. Yeah. Thank you, so much. Yeah. yeah, and let's definitely talk more too. All right. And uh, and the fourth one is on behalf of my co-founder from Ruckus, Angela McCrory. 
Um, her father, he's been in a wheelchair for a, a very, very long time. And uh, when I saw what, what, what you're creating, it gave me a lot of hope, uh, and her as well hope, for uh, what the future can look like for people who are disabled in that way. I know that's not immediately your, your first application, but uh, it's, a, it's a technology that can be used for other things as well like that. Um, and helping people get in and out of cars, you know, is tremendous in, in terms of lowering the stress and, and making them think that they can uh, live a happier life. So I think it's great and wish you all the success in the world uh, with it. Hi, Shep Moyle, class of 84. Bad news for you, after 28 years of an entre entrepreneurship, this is what you look like. So that's what you've got. Um, and as a recent past president of the uh, Alumni Association, I want to thank Melissa and Doug for putting together a program that really brings together alumni and students. This is what it's all about. So thank you. Uh, so I have uh, three uh, companies that I would like to invest in uh, tonight. So Sam uh, with Zephyr and uh, Uzo uh, with Relief, and Frank uh, with Inspectex. Uh, yeah, I'm Greg. Uh, I was uh, classroom through with Howie in, uh, at Fuqua. So first off, Howie, I want to say to you, I've seen this program grow for the four years, and hats off to you. You're doing an awesome job, and I know you're an inspiration to a lot of people here. Uh, so second, I want to say, you know, I brought, uh, as a fellow entrepreneur, I brought my two young kids, uh, seven and nine-year-old Theo and Elliot. Of course, the seven-year-old fell asleep in about the first 30 seconds. But uh, you know, it's, it's awesome. I wanted them to be around, uh, you know, young folks that are, uh, you know, starting off in your career um, with such ambitions of moving the, the, the earth an eighth of an inch. And it's, it's inspiring to be here. I wish I could commit to all seven of you. Uh, I can't. Um, and so, uh, but what I will is with Mackenzie, who I know couldn't be here tonight, but so impressed with what she's doing. So uh, my virtual hug to Mackenzie. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'm Joe Salduti. I graduated a long time ago from Pratt in 88, and I've had the pleasure, too, of uh, being in the Duke Angel Network since, since the guys founded it. And so, first of all, I hope all you guys succeed and get to that next level where the Duke Angel Network can kind of sponsor you forward. Uh, today, I'm going to invest in two companies, uh, Zephyr Mobility and Peer Connect. I just think you guys are solving a problem that'll help society as well as make money. So. Good luck to you guys. Hi, I'm Jack Fewer. I graduated Duke in 1988, and I have a son who's a freshman at Duke. So I, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm also uh, an entrepreneur. I've started two companies, run my own company. Um, it's a digital advertising and consulting business, but uh, I'm going to invest in a business that will not utilize my, my skills, but I believe has a huge market potential and is, uh, is kind of broken right now, and it's in the healthcare industry and with Zephyr Mobility. Uh, I'm Ken Weil, a class of 82. My wife Audrey is back there, and we, uh, <laughs> we're just thrilled to be here and, and hear what you guys are doing. It's very exciting. Shep and I were talking um, just before about how we were only qualified to probably start a beer distribution business after we graduated <laughs> from Duke, and that didn't work. And, and I'm personally, I, I was, uh, I'm really a big company guy. I've worked in big companies. I tried one startup. Uh, I know you'll be more successful than I was, let's just put it that way. So anyway, Audrey and I were talking about this on the way over here, and we're like, okay, we can, you know, we'll invest in one company, what the heck, pick it. And then we were like, you know what, we, we love two ideas, so we're going to invest in two companies instead, and it would be uh, Zephyr Mobility and also Ungraded uh, Produce. We really love those ideas and think there's a lot of potential. I 
know from the last one up here. I'm Richie Prager, uh, class of 81, parents of 08, uh, 10, and 12. I'm here with my business partner, Saperna Vaybrad. Hopefully her son will be class of 22. If anyone knows anyone, help us. Um, we had uh, a lot of discussion, actually, because it's such an amazing idea. So we're going to make uh, two investments, um, one with uh, Courtney and one with uh, Relief. Um, we're very impressed with all of them, but we really like the social aspect of these two. And Let's give everybody a round of applause. You know, I know we were going to wait to the end for Melissa and Doug to come up, but that was amazing. I would love for them to just come up and say a few words, if you don't mind. I mean, that was really, that was really so exciting. And uh, I'd love to just uh, invite them to say hello here. And then we're going to go to our, our final pitches here. Wow. Congrats, you guys. You did so well. I'm like a proud mama. So, sorry, the light. So one thing, I think one of our biggest lessons in this class was how much you need a dedicated community and team around you to be successful, that alone you can't make it. Um, because not everybody has all the skills they need and all the support they need to really get there. And, you know, this venture for us, Melissa and Doug Entrepreneurs, is, is truly an entrepreneurial effort, uh, just like our business was 30 years ago. And I think, you know, we are still, Doug and I run our company full time, and it has taken the effort of a team to get where we are tonight. And I just want to thank everybody who was so kind to come here to mentor these kids, to invest in their businesses, and to Howie and Tatiana and Jake and Steve for being such amazing, amazing custodians of this venture of ours and um, we could not do it without you. So thank you so, so much. And um, thanks to all of you for putting your heart and soul into this while being students. I mean, we you know, could barely do it not being students, but you guys are doing this while going through Duke. It's just, I'm so humbled to be in your presence, so thank you. I'll, I'll just talk quickly. Um, this in <laughs> um, I thought it was interesting that Shep, Shep's out there somewhere um, uh, warned you guys um, what would happen when you've been entrepreneurs for 24 years. And I just want to, uh, he said that was the bad news, and I just want to say to Shep, there's bad news for you. When you've been, in, when you've been an entrepreneur for 30 years, <laughs> that's, that's what you have left. It's all gone. So be happy with what you got. <laughs> um, so one way to measure um, the, uh, the success of this program that I, I, I have to notice is that if you just simply follow one thing, and it's Howie's wardrobe, because <laughs> I've seen it go from t-shirt to sweater to meticulously ironed <laughs> button-down shirt, so, so it's moving in the right direction. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where you're going next year. The, uh, the one thing that I wanted to notice and comment on that I think is the coolest thing of all is that each, each thing that you guys have chosen to devote your time to is, it's not, a, it's not just a, a business, it's not just a money-making proposition. I mean, every single one of them is doing something good for people. And I actually think that's amazing, and because that doesn't always happen. And the nice thing about that happening is that then you really have a, a passion for it that's even deeper, because you're doing it for the right reasons. And, that's where Melissa and I got started, and we talk about that a lot to this day, and we started, and sure, right, and back in the 80s, um, when everyone said, you know, what's a good way to make money? We said, well, making wooden puzzles, of course. Uh, so, so for us, it was always about making good products for children, 
And that's what I'm especially impressed with um, from listening in on the presentations tonight, that the incredibly good things that are gonna come, every single one of you is working on things that are gonna fill real needs out there, things that people need and, and will make life better for everyone. So I think that's the most unbelievable thing of all and I really commend all of you for that. I just wanna echo Melissa for thanking everyone who participated um, and is supporting this as mentors and sharks because that's, that's really what keeps this, keeps this going, right? That helps create a lot of the pull for it um, and it's getting better every year. So you guys are awesome and we love being part of this. Good job, guys. <laughs> You're gonna look good bald. <laughs> okay, so thank you all. You can have a seat now. So um, this is so exciting, and uh, what is gonna happen next is that uh, we're gonna do a, a bit of a sprint, a bit of a quick thing where, again, these uh, several alumni teams have made great progress. They are also looking for financing. Uh, since uh, we're not offering them financing tonight, I'm only going to suggest we do presentations and no Q&A because we're going to have a networking session afterwards, and if you have any questions, you can go up with, to them afterwards. So we're going to jump in. We're going to do a sprint and go through a bunch of presentations here, and we are going to start right away with Flower Child Remedies. Hi. My name is Tiana Horn, and I'm the CEO of Flower Child Remedies. Flower Child Remedies is an all-natural hair care company that stands behind the ideas of simple, natural, and pure hair care products. We don't believe in putting anything into your hair that you wouldn't feel safe putting into your body. Three years ago, I cut off all of my hair because like thousands of other men and women, I was using products that caused unknown damage to my hair. This damage ranged from making my hair dry and brittle to actually breaking down its DNA bonds. We surveyed 300 people within our target market and heard some of the same complaints. Products were either too harsh, too expensive, or didn't cater to their hair's specific needs. 80% of the people we surveyed said they prefer products made using all natural ingredients. Our solution is a line of products which are natural, safe to use, and even customizable. At the beginning of last summer, we had a lone product, a hair and skin moisturizer. We now have a curl, a curl pudding, a baby hair gel, which is also an edge control, and branded hair picks and combs. Our customers love it. After a single use, they're able to see a noticeable difference in the look and feel of their hair. They love the way their hair smells, smells, feels, and even how long our products last. We've also expanded our ability to cater to our customers' specific needs by offering customizable products. Now, buyers can go online, complete a hair survey, and receive a personal product based on their own hair goals. Our target market is the same market that created the first self-made female millionaire, the black hair industry. Black women on average spend nine times more than any other race on hair care products. Of the 300 people we surveyed, 72% said they use hair products every day. Half of those people said they spend $15 or more on hair products each month. It costs us less than $4 to make product and less than $1 to make merchandise. Capturing one person of this market would easily make a multi-million dollar company. I graduated from Duke last year, but while in undergrad, I had the opportunity to work with Durham-based startups. My co-founder, who is also my cousin, is a senior at Ryder University where she's learning valuable business and marketing skills. We also have two new Duke interns. Tyler Johnson is our campus brand ambassador and she's currently a freshman. Shaun Okimi is our chemist and she's also a hair influencer on YouTube with over 32,000 subscribers. We've sold over 500 units of products from online and in-person sales. We have a five-star rating on Amazon and we've also seen significant social media exposure through a feature on Natural Hair Mag, a Facebook page with over a million followers. We also had a video, a promo video, get over 18,000 views before this feature. And we just got into our first store, North Carolina's biggest beauty store, Beauty World. We've bootstrapped our company thus far, but we're looking for $75,000 to go towards marketing and inventory to increase brand awareness within our target customers. 
We plan to target local stores and then go after larger retailers through their supplier diversity programs. We also plan to implement traditional and less conventional manners of marketing. If anyone would like a sample of our product, please talk to me after this pitch or if you'd like to learn more. And you can also reach me at Tiana at flowerchildremedies.com. Thank you. Thank you, Tiana. We did have two cancellations uh, tonight, so we only have three more pitches. So next up is Canyon Delomo with WorkerSense. Hey, uh, my name's Canyon. I'm a senior at Duke right now, and WorkerSense is my company. Uh, so I was actually just up in Connecticut last month. Uh, it was really hot up here. I was on this big uh, utility solar install on the other side of the state. And when I got on site, I found out that one of the workers two weeks ago had ended up in the emergency room due to a heat stress injury. Uh, based on industry averages, this cost his employer roughly $40,000 in direct costs, not to mention the indirect costs associated with lost time or raised EMI. Um, alternatively, we could have shown up on site two weeks earlier and they could have seen this text message before that happened. I don't know if you can read that because it's uh, a little far away, but basically it says the name of this worker and that he's exceeded his OSHA safe limits, how long of a break he has to take and where he is on site. Um, the task of balancing the performance of your job site with the safety of your job site is very challenging for project managers across the construction and energy contracting spaces. Um, it's particularly daunting when you have to keep up with really strict deadlines, but also be expected to be accounting for the health and well-being of 100 plus workers across a 60 acre install. And the numbers reflect this. So we saw the 40K figure earlier. That compounds across the entire industry to around $850 million in losses just for that type of injury. And then you also overlook productivity related issues. So people, when they get on site, not getting to work immediately, taking extended breaks, declining in performance throughout the day. This compounds to around $1,800 per worker per year based on data we've collected on projects we've been on. And we provide a solution to that. So we start with a custom hard hat mounted sensory device that goes on each worker, tracks their environmental exposure, their caloric expenditure, their GPS position, as, long, uh, as well as a zero through 100 performance rating. This all gets fed into our cloud-based analytic system where you see as needed updates like you saw on the second slide, um, if it's a safety or time sensitive issue. Scheduled reports like you see on the screen uh, that will show you stats about how your site performed that day, when people got on your site, when they left, and how your job has progressed. And then interactive systems where you can reply to that number with different commands and in real time get different pieces of info about your site. Uh, it's designed to be super simple. One of the biggest barriers to entry in the construction space is just the time taken to train your workforce on how to use it and get it implemented. So by taking advantage of just email and SMS, it's really just drag and drop onto any site you want to get onto. And setup's equally as easy. You get your Pelican case in the mail, which doubles as the charging dock, scan the QR code, and within three to four hours, everything's live, and you can use it without any formal training. Pricing model is very straightforward. Uh, you have a $25 per device setup fee uh, as soon as you get on site, and that is followed up by a $300 per year price point per device. Uh, manufacturing cost, as you can see, $70 to $80, depending on volume, and roughly $20 for uh, data storage and cloud computing per device. Uh, this is me. I founded the company a year and a half ago. Uh, I was in the Melissa and Doug group last year. Uh, I do all the hardware, software development, business development, et cetera. Um, advisors, um, combination of Duke and construction people to uh, keep me in the loop. Um, timeline to date, so we've raised about 100K to date. Um, we're currently doing demos and trial programs for uh, companies throughout the construction, energy, energy maintenance, and telecom spaces. Um, I'd like to have five of these transition to paying customers by the end of December, uh, ramping up to around 15 by February, leading into a prospective 500K raise in March. Cool. Uh, that's, that's all I have for you guys. Okay, just two more presenters. Next up is Mina Mejila. 
Hi everyone, I'm Suhani and I, along with a couple of women from the slums of Mumbai, started the Mena Mahila Foundation in 2015. Um, we're a network of young female entrepreneurs that are making low-cost, high-quality women health products in the slums of Mumbai by creating the largest distribution network of women that are going to the doorstep uh, delivering sanitary napkins today. Now before I tell you more, let me take you to a slum in Mumbai where Kaja lives. This is also where we work. Um, it's that time of the month for her where she has her periods, but she doesn't really know how to manage them. She has these old rags that she keeps at home that she uses, and after using them, she keeps them under her bed to dry them because she doesn't want her husband to know that she has her periods. The other alternative is to, have, to get pads from the market, which she has, she has some available, there's some availability of pads in the chemist shop because there's a huge variety of pads in the market. But she's sitting in the slum, and all she has to do is walk to that chemist shop, but she doesn't do that because of a lot of shame and stigma and confusion that's associated with it. The problem here really is of accessibility of sanitary napkins, not necessarily its availability. So we, that's where Mena comes in. What we really try to do is help girls like Kajal, as we see that this is not a problem of just one, one, one woman in one slum in one city in India, but the problem with 40% of all of, all of India's menstruating women, which is about 320 million people, that's the population of the United States, almost. That's the large market that we're trying to tackle here with an incredible team of over 70 years of combined community development experience of community leaders and members from the local community that have a lot of experience going door to door, collecting savings as part of different self-help groups, as well as working with us on various ventures. We have been manufacturing over the last two and a half years um, various sanitary napkins, like the three products that you see here. Uh, we've been holding a lot of menstrual hygiene workshops and courses and running campaigns in the community, as well as in the broader Mumbai community, try to reach out to donors. Um, and over the last two and a half years, we've also manufactured over 500,000 pads, reached out to 3,000 customers in about 15 slums in Mumbai. Um, and growing. We have over 90% customer repeat rate here because women really love the way that the pads are delivered to their doorstep in this really personalized individual way, um, in a way that they can ask questions, in a way that they can um, get responses from us. We can connect them to gynecologists and really connect them to the broader community to start talking about these pads. We don't just sell them to women, but also to men to get them for their husbands. Uh, we really have such incredible, powerful stories um, women are now demanding a lot of other products like baby diapers and adult diapers, um, underwears, and all the other products that can be delivered at their doorstep, which we're now trying to figure out how to do. So we have really tried to understand the whole ecosystem of menstrual hygiene, from providing education about sanitary napkins to talking about usability, its disposal, um, and really talking about manufacturing as well as getting it at their doorstep and trying to see what other services and products that we can provide to them to create healthier, more confident women. And we know with the girl effect that creating a healthier community um, of women also creates better, more empowered um, economies um, in these local settings, especially in the slum group, which um, in just in Mumbai alone is over 50% of the population of the city, which is over 12 million people. Um, so with the new model now, uh, we're really trying to dig deeper into the accessibility problem. We've been working on the whole ecosystem, but trying to dig deeper into getting the pads into hands of as many women as possible. We want to be outsourcing a lot of that manufacturing to third-party manufacturers, um, getting the final product, focusing a lot more on local packaging of that product, and then getting this into the hands of as many women with our MENA fleet on fleet. Um, we not only want to be going door to door, but we do realize the majority of the accessibility problem lies there. We also want to be going to garment factories and other large businesses that employ a lot of women in their local communities and they don't yet use sanitary napkins. In garment factories, it's a very, very easy market for women to be able to use the rags that come out of these factories. We have about 30,000, 40,000 women in a single factory that are not using these. Um, we've been in talks with a couple of companies where we can provide these pads to them um, there. We're also giving it to vending machines provided in colleges and, and schools where they're setting these vending machines where we're giving sanitary napkins to give accessibility there. Um, even to NGOs and local police stations in a lot of these slum communities where police women have no access to sanitary napkins anywhere. Um, going to local trains and public toilets, basically anywhere where women can get access to these products where we don't yet have them. Uh, we are very uniquely positioned to do this because our group um, is, contains, it, it consists of the local community members who have 
immense experience working in the communities to develop them, as well as with local businesses. Um, we are trying to use technology in a way that's never been done before to organize a self-help group network that is, that is present in 75 cities in India and some of the most remote districts across the country in rural areas as well. Um, we already have an established customer base that we're trying to build off of, um, and we, are, we have a group of really experienced um, advisors. Um, ranging from various NGOs to large businesses like Hitachi and textile companies, uh, really trying to provide us with a lot of help with the raw materials for the sanitary napkins and even um, for our education campaigns with Johnson & Johnson and Miracle um, and a couple of other companies as well. So we've not just created impact in numbers but in stories as well. Uh, the women that work with us, they've gone from not even being able to say their name in public to now talking about pads and periods openly, giving and holding these workshops. Um, and they've been really trying to sell these sanitary napkins to as many women and educating them um, and also talking about these other products. We, but we know, don't we just want to stop there. We want to be reaching out to over 10 million women over the next five years. Um, these are women customers by employing over 100,000 women in our, uh, in our marketing and sales distribution network and reaching out to over a thousand communities. And we are confident that that's possible um, because of this already established self-help group partnership that we have um, that's, that's already national. Um, our projected revenue of the next five years is over $5 million. Um, and we're looking for $50,000 here to be able to really make this dig distribution network digital um, and kick it off um, initially in uh, all of the slums in Bombay, which is about 25 different communities. Uh, we've received support from a couple of other organizations um, because we're not just a company, we're a movement. And we hope that you can join us in trying to change the world one pad at a time. Thank you. Mike Brown closed last night and he absolutely killed it, so I hope I can keep that uh, trend going. Here we go. Um, whew, I am still nervous, you know. Two years ago, I was on this stage feeling just as nervous as I am right now. Uh, so my name is Casper. I just graduated Duke this May, and I was a Melissa and Doug fellow two years ago. So Melissa, Doug, Howie, thank you so much for bringing me back and letting me tell all of you guys about Carpe and give you an update on how we're doing. Um, so. I trip over my words a lot, so I think the best way to get Carpe introduced is to hand the floor over to myself and my co-founder David in this uh, national TV commercial that we're airing right now. Hi, I'm Casper. And I'm David. And we both had a really embarrassing problem, sweaty hands and feet. So we started to look for a solution, and when we couldn't find any, we decided to make one. Carpe Antiperspirant Lotion. It's really simple to use. Just rub in a dab and say goodbye to the sweat. We started hearing from thousands of people who are using and loving Carpe to help stop the sweat. And we learned that it's actually a medical condition called hyperhidrosis or excessive sweating and that millions of Americans have it. So we said, let's meet these folks. And we hopped on a plane. This is it. Hi. And we met Jamie. Hyperhidrosis makes it super hard to shake hands with people, super hard to meet people. It just made everything that I did a little more irritating. But with Carpe, it's definitely better. I would recommend Carpe to anyone who is feeling insecure about their hand sweat. So if you, like Jamie, like us, have suffered from sweaty hands and feet, you're the reason we made Carpe. Try it out at CarpeLotion.com. Um, but yeah, that's, that's Carpe. And <laughs> thank you. I have a bit more. Um, we, uh, we started Carpe in 2014. David and I, we had sweaty hands, and we wanted to do something about it. And in 2015 is when I was selected as a Melissa and Doug Fellow, and thanks to this program, thanks to Howie, I was connected with Ben, Jay, and Chris, three Duke alumni, bootstrap advisors, who put in $50,000 and basically came on as co-founders to get us started, to get this product that David and I had developed to market. And right now, we're selling at a $1.2 million run rate, and we're one of the best-selling antiperspirants on Amazon. So let's talk about this problem that Carpe is helping to solve. It's called hyperhidrosis, or the condition of excessive sweating. And recent estimates put it at about 1 in 10 adults and 1 in 5 teens in the United States. But people don't realize that it's so significant because it's underdiagnosed and underreported. And people with hyperhidrosis, people like myself, we really know how to hide it. We don't shake hands. We don't hold hands. We hold microphones like this so we don't leave sweat marks on them. Um, 
And it really affects people a lot because for people like Jamie and myself, we can deal with it. It's an irritation, but for a lot of people, it's debilitating. Studies have found it to be the most significantly life-altering skin condition. Half of people with hyperhidrosis have changed career paths because of it, and those one in five teens that I mentioned, 75% of them are impaired on a daily basis. The reason is that effective treatments do exist, but the accessibility to these treatments doesn't. Um, I'll, I'll go closer to the mic so you guys can cut down on the reverb. Uh, the accessibility to these treatments doesn't exist because the effective treatments are out there, but they're surgical, they're prescription. They have huge side effects and huge costs, and you have to go to doctors. And, and there's one exception. Hyperhidrosis affects the hands, feet, and underarms. And there's over-the-counter antiperspirants for the underarms that you can get at just about any CVS, Walgreens, you know, the stuff you put on every morning. But there was nothing like that for the hands and feet, and that's what David and I set out to develop with Carpe. It's over-the-counter, completely non-irritating, so it's very accessible, um, but it's very effective. Even if in moderate cases of hyperhidrosis, dermatologists are starting to recommend it as a first-line treatment. Um, the team is very Duke. My co-founder, David, was UNC, but he spent a semester at Duke, so let's count him as Duke. And uh, very recently, Dr. Patel, who is Duke undergrad and med school, has come on and is really, he's working with hyperhidrosis patients every day and is helping us guide the development of this product. Uh, as we continue to increase efficacy. So let me talk a bit about that. Sales history right now, $1.2 million annual run rate, over a million dollars in lifetime sales. And we got that way through that TV ad, which we're getting a dollar fifty back on every dollar that we spend. I know we might be able to do better online, and I heard a few people mention that earlier tonight, so I'd love to talk to you later after this presentation. And we're also really seriously engaged in the dermatology community. We are trying to compete with these prescription and surgical treatments and make this a first-line treatment for hyperhidrosis. So we've proven that this OTC approach tackling hyperhidrosis to increasing access is a huge opportunity. And right now, we want to seize that opportunity by going beyond one product and turning this into a whole company that's addressing this problem. And we're raising $2 million to do that, to increase marketing and to increase R&D. So on the marketing side, a lot of people who could still benefit from Carpe just don't realize that it exists. They don't realize there's anything they can do about their sweaty hands and feet. And that's why we keep running this TV ad and we're keeping growing marketing. And that's getting more and more interest from retailers because ultimately we want this to be just as accessible as any other underarm antiperspirant that you can go get at CVS, Walgreens, Harris Teeter, Walmart, anywhere. And we're already in talks with CVS, Walgreens. We've got a verbal commitment to be in Q1 of 2018 on HSN, so that part is growing very quickly. Um, but as Melissa told me recently, we're not gonna make a successful company out of one product. We need to keep innovating to stay ahead of this market because we're showing before anybody else that, that there's a huge opportunity here and we need to keep capturing it by growing efficacy, by taking this over-the-counter approach and treating more and more severe cases of hyperhidrosis, making treatment more accessible to all those patients. The development of the Carpe Hyperhidrosis Regimen, which is the next step in that path, is already underway. Um, beyond hyperhidrosis, there are so many other conditions where this is the case. You have expensive treatments with severe side effects and high costs, and there's a huge opportunity in growing the accessibility of over-the-counter treatments. So our goal right now is to dominate the market in hyperhidrosis, but beyond that, this company can do so much more than that. Um, to any skeptics out there who still think hyperhidrosis might not be worth the investment, that's what pharma companies said about acne in the 80s. But one company named Proactive came in they made accessible OTC treatments very effective in treating acne, and they're a billion dollar company right now. So hyperhidrosis is that next opportunity, and Carpe is the company that's seizing that opportunity. Uh, so I have a 30 page pitch deck I'd love to send to anybody who's interested, but that's the quick and dirty of it, thank you. Thank you, Howard. thank you. Okay, well, um, that's our show. Uh, Melissa and Doug and Tatiana and Jake, I would invite you all to come up to say any, any final words that you would want to say, and then we're going to jump into networking here. So Jake, I see you coming up. So Jake and Tani, we'll have you go first. And Melissa and Doug, if you feel moved, we'll have you go second. Uh, all I can say is, wow, uh, I'm so impressed with... Wow, wow, wow. I mean, what, how crazy is this? This is amazing. Give her the mic, Jake. Outshining me. Um, so, so, I mean, so impressed with, one, the, the students' performance, um, great job on your pitches. It's so exciting to see how far you've come and how well you communicated that. And I just want a round of applause for the investors that put in what I calculate is $130,000 in these companies. That's, 
that's just incredible. That's what this event is about, is helping these companies get to the next level. And, and I'm just amazed. And I'm happy to go to networking, so maybe you guys can close some more deals. I don't know. Again, thank you so much to the Sharks for showing up and really standing up here and getting as excited as we are with what we've seen. And um, maybe next year we'll get it to $260,000. And I, I know that we can do that by showing off the success of the stories that we've had to date and the companies getting to the next level and achieving enormous success. So thank you again for helping these students reach their dreams. I just want to say one thing about these two. I mean, these two are in the throes of building their own businesses. And they're at the point, where when Doug and I were at your point, we did not raise our heads for anything, even our own children. So the fact that you, by example, are literally giving back so early in your careers and giving so much to these young entrepreneurs is like truly unprecedented. And I hope that some of you who are standing up here can learn from them so that when you're at that point, you will also give back to young entrepreneurs because it's totally different than, than you know, Doug and I speaking to, to them. You guys are like in the trenches where they are every day. So your support of them is, is so life-changing. So I hope you realize that you're literally, hopefully going to create an entire cycle of young entrepreneurs helping other young entrepreneurs. So thank you so much.